thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to this roundtable discussion um, where we will address the power of pro bono work to facilitate change for animals. Um, this session will explore the benefits for, of pro bono work by discussing cases including free speech in animal mark and food marketing and freeing wild animals from inhumane captivity. Um, my name is Andrea Rodericks. I am the pro bono managing attorney for the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Um, so I work with our pro bono program. Um, I probably have interacted with many of you or hope to at some point. Um, and we, in our pro bono program, take on um, and look for pro bono counsel to assist both with internal animal legal defense fund projects, as well as a stream of public assistance requests that we get in um, to help people with their animal issues um, in sort of an access to justice component. Um, we are, we have two wonderful panelists with us today um, to join me in this discussion. Um, with me is Tarak Anada who is a seasoned trial attorney par uh, and partner in the litigation practice at Jones Walker. His broad multi-industry experience enables him to develop effective litigation strategies geared towards achieving decisive and cost-effective wins for his clients. Tarak has represented individuals and organizations in numerous pro bono matters, including to protect animal rights and well-being, which we will discuss in depth in a bit. Um, committed to educating the next generation of lawyers, Tarak also serves as an adjunct professor of law at the Louisiana State University Paul M. Hebert Law Center, where he teaches a pretrial litigation seminar course. Also joining us today is Brian Saunders, who is an associate at Quinn Emanuel's Washington DC office. He joined the firm in 2021. Um, Brian's practice focuses on intellectual property litigation before the US district courts, the federal circuit court and the international trade commission with an emphasis on patent litigation. Brian has also participated in pro bono matters, including working with the Animal Legal Defense Fund to protect animal rights and well being, which we will also discuss in more depth. Brian's technical experience spans the gamut. He has litigated and counseled clients in numerous technical fields, including biotechnology, GPS and biometric devices, internet access technologies, computer software, and fitness devices, to name a few. Um, so this presentation is going to be a little bit more of a round table. So I'm actually going to um, take a seat with our panelists and we will begin the discussion. Mike is working. Yes. Oh, I just heard it. <laughs> um, so thank you both for joining us. Um, Thanks for having us. Thank yeah, you. we are excited to have this discussion. Um, so you both are part of our pro bono network um, and have been for, sorry, yeah, um, for many, many years. Um, so I think the first question that we wanted to sort of talk about was um, the work that you've done with ALDF. Um, you both have participated in many projects throughout your careers. Um, so if you want to sort of give a little bit of an overview of the projects that you've been a part of um, with the Animal Legal Defense Fund, I know we are going to talk a little bit about some other things that are aren't ALDF related, but we'll start with sort of ALDF projects. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Um, thank you very much for having us. Um, I got involved with the ALDF when I was a first year associate with Jones Walker uh, a long, long time ago. Um, and it was about a case um, about a roadside animal zoo. We've heard about other attorneys um, working those kinds of cases with the ALDF, and ours was about a roadside zoo in um, kind of a rural area of Louisiana called the Tiger Truck Stop. And it was, it was, it was really sad. Um, it was a, a cage and enclosure keeping a beautiful tiger um, in captivity right next to idling um, 18 wheelers. Um, and um, with, with um, a couple other attorneys in Louisiana and some very, very passionate and dedicated ALDF attorneys, we, we had some success in that case and um, without getting too much in the nitty-gritty that that roadside zoo no longer exists and was was put out of business during the pendency of our case so I'm, I'm very proud of that and that kind of got me hooked on uh, ALDF pro bono work and it got me um, uh, opportunity to meet a lot of the very talented ALDF attorneys um, so fast forward um, over a decade from that case um, I was approached by the ALDF about 
a string of laws that were running through the leg legislatures in, in the South United States, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, and other states. Um, basically, all of these state laws around 2018, 2019 were, were very similar, and legislatures were en enacting these, these acts. Uh, Louisiana called theirs the Truth in Labeling of Food Products Acts. And essentially what, what these acts were, um, were legislatures prohibiting commercial free speech that allegedly confuse consumers into accidentally buying vegan products when they're searching for meat products. Um, I, I will suggest that there are, 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 are no people that accidentally buy vegan products that are looking for meat products. And I will further suggest that, that um, state legislatures are, are often trying to help their constituents, which may be big agriculture, especially in, in state of Louisiana. Um, so the, the Louisiana law, which is similar to the Arkansas law, which ALDF also handled, and it's similar to the Texas law that we are now um, suing over, now that Louisiana is handled, basically says, if you have a product that is not meat, meaning not derived from an animal carcass, you can't use meat terms in, in, the, in the labeling. So think about it, um, can't use, can't, can't have a product labeled as veggie burger. You know, think of what this would do to like a whole foods, you know. Um, you can't have a plant-based sausage. Um, the, the list goes, goes on and on, this applies to um, non-dairy products as well, cheeses, um, cauliflower rice even could, could apply to. But essentially, you can't use meat terms unless your product is, is derived from animal carcasses, but the only qualifier in the law is it only applies to companies that are intentionally misrepresenting a food product as meat when the food is not in fact derived from meat. So, I mean, how does one, how does a company can regulate its business in a, in a state that has a statute like this? Um, we represented Tofurky in this case in Louisiana, and we sued Michael Strain, who's the commissioner of agriculture and forest, forestry in Louisiana. And um, essentially we said, this is an impingement on protected commercial speech. And um, you'd be um, putting this company in very similar, similar companies, um, preventing them to, from doing business in Louisiana. And uh, we sued in the middle district of Louisiana, which is where the state capital and Louisiana Baton Rouge is located. And uh, I will never forget the day when we, we drew this. Is, Louisiana is very conservative uh, judiciary. Um, lots of very conservative federal judges. Um, and it's not the most um, friendly forum for, for progressive causes, I guess is one way to um, describe it. But we pulled the best judge in the entire state of Louisiana. It was, it was um, fantastic luck. And um, we, we convinced him that, that this act was unconstitutional and it, it um, was enacted with zero evidence of any consumer confusion whatsoever. We pulled the, the transcripts from the legis legislatures and I've, I've never actually gotten to read um, in real time how law is, is enacted. And it, it was shocking to me at the, the, uh, the fact, it was shocking to me at the amount of evidence or no evidence that the legislators had to present to, to get this law passed. Um, so essentially the district court sided with us, held that the law was unconstitutional and that it violated the first amendment and uh, we won, it was great. Um, the state then appealed uh, the decision to the fifth circuit, which is um, in my experience, the most conservative um, circuit in the United States. Um, and when we saw the panel, we, we kind of knew that this panel was not gonna do us any favors. Um, we, we, we had our, best attorney on the team, uh, Amanda Howell with the ALDF, as our, our uh, counsel who argued the case did a phenomenal job. And you could tell, we could tell right from the first question from the panel, they were not on our side. They were going to, they wanted to reverse the district judge and we could tell um, from the start, but Amanda did a great job. And essentially it's, it's funny, 
Fifth Circuit actually did overturn the district court. But in doing so, I think they accidentally gave us exactly what we want. <laughs> Basically, this statute defined what intentional misbranding is. And one of the statutory ways you can intentionally misbrand in, in Louisiana is by using terms such as sausage or burger, which it was undisputed that Tofurky used all of those meat terms. The state defended by the case by saying Tofurky's products don't violate this law. And we said, well, it sure looks like they, they do um, under the plain language of the statute. And furthermore, right now, the, the current commissioner is saying that our products don't violate the law, but what's preventing the next, next uh, commissioner from taking a different position? So basically the Fifth Circuit <laughs> looked at this law, looked at our products, which if anyone's products in the world violate this law, it was Tofurky's, and said, this, these products do not run afoul of this, this law. So they reversed the district court. We didn't have standing to bring the case, but it, it made the law completely toothless. So there, there is really no scenario I can think of where a company's labeling could violate this law if Tofurky's labeling did not violate the law. So it was, it was a, a useful um, loss that just got rid of this law in its, in its own way. So um, we're following the same suit now in Texas. It's, it's brand new. We just filed uh, uh, Texas. The state has not answered the case. And uh, we, have, we have some mixed precedent on what we're going to do, but we have some different type of arguments going to wait. We're, we're going to make to try and get past the, the standing requirements. So that's that's a really important case that I'm really proud to have worked with the ALDF on. And uh, I'd like to talk about some pro bono stuff that I do um, outside of the LDF, but maybe I should say that for- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. why don't we, later. yeah, why don't we talk about ALDF right now? And then, yeah, I know you wanted to mention a few other things. Um, I did want to ask you though, what drew you to the Tofurky project? Um, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm a vegan. Uh, my wife's a vegan. My, my parents are- vegetarian and uh, I don't I don't want vegan companies to have trouble doing business in my state uh, personally um, I, I um, have also worked with ALDF um, on numerous cases I'm friends with a lot of the lawyers and I have not and don't plan to turn down any opportunity to work with them and then finally when when do commercial litigators really get to litigate constitutional law I mean for me um, it's it's been a handful of times. That was my favorite subject in law school, and I, I never get to touch it in a, in a regular Jones Walker litigation case. And I was I was really happy to have the opportunity to do that. Great. Well, we also appreciate your help on that. So thank you, um, Brian. Do you want to talk about? Um, you've actually helped with a couple cases um, recently. So do you want to talk about those? Yeah, sure. Um, so. My practice, as Andrea introduced, is in intellectual property litigation. So I typically find myself in federal district court or some federal court of appeals. So taking on animal rights cases uh, on behalf of the ALDF was a, a change in pace from my normal practice, but a very welcome one. Um, I think we'll talk about a little bit later about how we first got interested in, in doing this work, but I'll share very briefly that my first introduction to animal law was from law school. My first year legal writing professor, in the course of giving us our legal writing assignments, our sort of brief um, appellate brief and argument uh, assignment was a constitutional issue that had its uh, footholdings in animal law. So whether a plaintiff who views endangered species has Article Three standing under the Constitution to bring a case in federal court. And there's a whole three-pronged inquiry, Lujan v. Defenders of Wildlife and its progeny, um, very interesting line of work that when I went to law school, I knew I was going to wind up in intellectual property because I have a background in science and technologies. So this was a, a really welcome and interesting change of pace for me. And, and flash forward to later when I'll talk about in a moment, uh, one of the cases that I've done for the ALDF brought all of these issues back to light again as I found myself litigating under the Endangered Species Act and needing to make sure that when I filed this complaint, we made enough of a factual showing that these plaintiffs could withstand any attack from an Article Three sort of challenge uh, to their ability to be plaintiffs and have a case of controversy. So it all kind of came full circle. And it's interesting that I found myself back in, in the field once again. And uh, my first real involvement with the ALDF was, I believe as a second year associate at my firm, uh, I was part of an intellectual property boutique law firm that found itself being acquired or merged into a much larger firm. And so, 
while I was originally around only other technology enthusiasts and patent litigators, now we were absorbed into this larger entity of um, individuals who practice all across the spectrum in transactional and litigation work. Litigation was always sort of where I thought myself going. Um, I started getting involved in litigation work on the pure technology side of things. And then when we merged into the larger firm, one of the partners in our newly acquired, you know, our newly acquired entity reached out and said, hey, I have this animal rights case. Does any associate, you know, interested in taking on this work? And prior to that, my boutique law firm was only doing pro bono work and representing inventors who needed help getting a patent or getting a trademark. So this was very, very different than any sort of intellectual property project, uh, pro bono project that my firm had at that time. So I jumped at that opportunity to get involved in the case. And what that case was, was a case uh, involving a bear being kept in captivity at a small ice cream shop in Pennsylvania, Ricky the bear. So we'll talk, I think, about that a little bit more. Uh, there's a video that I believe we're going to share. There's a happy ending to the story where the bear, uh, after our litigation efforts, was uh, rehomed uh, to a sanctuary in Colorado, sprawling sanctuary. And the video shows a nice follow-up to that, which I think we'll watch a little bit later on. But this case was an interesting one in that this owner uh, of an ice cream shop in Pennsylvania, Jim Max Ice Cream, uh, it's kind of a jack of all trades sort of business where this guy has ice cream and he's selling concessions and he's got a mini golf course, a petting zoo. And then in the front of his store bordering on the main road is this small little cage with this bear, Ricky, who had been living in this cage, I think for about 30 years or 20 something years, an excessive amount of time. Um, anybody who had seen this bear and posted on Yelp or on various parts of, of the internet remarked how this bear looked uncomfortable in this cage too small for the bear, clearly, the bear pacing back and forth. And we've got a vet involved to make a, a formal assessment of what they could observe about this bear. Obviously, can't go into the cage without the owner's permission. The owner wasn't going to grant this permission to observe this bear and what we could discern from what the bear was, you know, behavior that the bear was showing. And the pacing back and forth was emblematic of psychological stress that this bear was under, which is no surprise being in a small cage like that for so long. So we found a plaintiff, the primary plaintiff um, came to our attention, I think through the Animal Defense Fund, um, uh, Bennett, Kelly Bennett. Uh, she reached out and I think we were able to assemble uh, other plaintiffs from Yelp reviews and other places where you know, there, was, there was interest in, in doing something, taking some sort of action against this ice cream shop to find a new home for this bear. And so we ended up filing suit in a local court of common pleas in Pennsylvania. And myself, I'm used to litigating in federal court. Being in state court is a completely different animal, pardon the pun. Um, it's just, uh, you're, you're kind of, especially in Pennsylvania, you're dealing with uh, judges who um, you know, don't frequently get, at least at that time, animal captivity sorts of cases. And in fact, at the time where we brought this case, there was no real actionable animal uh, rights law in Pennsylvania that we could use as the crux to bring our legal claim. And so we had to bring a sort of novel claim under Pennsylvania law for a public nuisance. Uh, if you follow it through to completion, it's sort of a law school hypothetical almost that it's a nuisance to the public to see this bear in this terrible condition. There's risk that the bear could get out of its cage and pose a harm to the public. And through all of those sort of facts, together with a Pennsylvania Supreme Court case recently interpreting public nuisance law favorably for us, we were able to turn that around and make that part of our complaint and really our primary cause of action under the complaint to try to get um, you know, this, zoo clo this guy closed down from his, the standpoint of his possession of animals. And um, after filing the lawsuit, it was within a very short period of time, finally, that this guy um, decided that in the best interest of his animals, he was going to close down at least the portion where he was uh, having Ricky the bear in the cage, rehome Ricky the bear according to the animal DF's uh, wishes and instructions. And we were able to find a sanctuary in Colorado, the bear, the wildlife animal sanctuary, TWAS, I believe, um, sprawling animal sanctuary in Colorado, where this bear, after 20, 30 years in captivity, could still have uh, a good chunk of, of its life to live among other bears, uh, doing natural bear things, digging in dirt, um, hibernating, all the things that the bear was frankly unable to do being in this small cage. 
And uh, as part of the, um, the conclusion to the case, uh, there was a settlement agreement that we signed with the Jim Max ice cream shop, as well as uh, a rescue operation that we conducted where we brought film crew and we broke this bear out of the cage, loaded her up on the uh, transport and started the cross country trek to bring her to Colorado. And as we'll follow up with in a video shortly, um, the bear is doing fantastically out there. Uh, it really is kind of the, the best culmination of the litigation that we could have expected, um, seeing that not only that we made a difference and closed down you know, this, this guy's operation as far as his animals were concerned, but that the bear, the animal that we rescued, is really thriving in the new environment. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a great capstone to, to that work. Um, the second case that I was involved with was more on the endangered animal side of things. Also in Pennsylvania, there's a region up in Northern Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon or the Pennsylvania, I think the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, which I didn't know existed until this case come, came across our radar from the ALDF, but up in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania at the entrance to this kind of, the sprawling park was this small dilapidated, old and outdated uh, animal land zoo uh, called Animal Land. They had a number of animals at the zoo, including endangered animals, um, they had a Siberian tiger, they had a gray wolf, they had two bears in a cage about the size of Ricky's cage, if not very much bigger than that, um, um, as well as a number of other animals. Uh, I think they had capuchin monkeys and they had a couple of others as well. Um, also in terrible, terrible condition. We can't, we, um, the case was brought you know, to our attention by the Animal Defense Fund who wanted to take action uh, against them. And there were also a series of plaintiffs that we were able to identify via Yelp and other sorts of social media like postings. Um, we started really our investigation, not only through them and getting the individual accounts of these plaintiffs, which like I mentioned before, from an article three standing to establish that you have a case or controversy to bring in federal court, we needed enough facts in the complaint. So that means the plaintiffs needed to actually have seen these animals, have seen them recently, have intentions to return and see the animals again and that they were physically distressed or emotionally distressed from having seen these animals in this terrible condition. These are the sorts of facts that the federal courts, including the Supreme Court, has passed upon to show that that's enough or that approaches the bar of what's required in order to maintain an action in federal court. So we collected this information from the individual plaintiffs, as well as from the U USDA, which conducts uh, generally annual, sometimes semi-annual inspections of these, of these roadside zoos more frequently when they notice violations. And our take on this was really the, there were a fair amount of USDA violations, but we believe that they spoke to a greater problem because the USDA is really like the floor for the, the minimum requirements for what a zoo should be doing. If you see USDA violations for the fence is a little bit loose or there are pits in the floor, there's generally a lot more that's hiding beneath the cracks of those types of violations. And so when we investigated further and we had a, a, an investigator go out and take photographs for the purpose of kind of establishing this case, which were eventually used in the complaint, indeed, the problem was much, much worse than those USDA violations and the story that they told. So what we did was we assembled these plaintiffs, we wrote up this federal complaint and pursuant to the statute, um, Endangered Species Act, if you're gonna bring an Endangered Species Act claim, which you can only bring against uh, harms or violations for endangered animals. We couldn't assert an Endangered Species Act claim against for the bears or some of the non-endangered animals. We could only assert them for the endangered animals. However, as many of you might remember from law school and civil procedure, there's a statute um, 28 USC 1267 supplemental jurisdiction where you can assert state law claims in the same federal action that have a, um, a connection, a sufficient connection with the federal claims that you're asserting. And so the way we structured this complaint, almost exactly as the one that I had as an example in law school in that assignment, was you have a federal Endangered Species Act claim and tacked on state law claims for violation of state animal statutes or public nuisance. We actually cited the Ricky the Bear case in our complaint. So sort of bringing it back full circle there. Um, we asserted those kinds of claims in the Endangered Species Act as the primary cause of action and the secondaries being the, the state law claims for the harms to the non-endangered animals. Pursuant to the statute, when you are prepared to file a lawsuit, you can't just go ahead and turn around and file it. There's a 60 day waiting period under the statute where you need to give notice to the, uh, to the zoo or to the entity that you plan to file 
this federal complaint if they don't take corrective action, as you outlined. And you have to copy a couple of other government officials, such as the Secretary of the Interior and others. Um, during that time period, after we sent that letter, that formal package to them, I was monitoring the activities of the zoo on social media because they were very active on Facebook and posting like, come visit our animals doing this today or doing this today. And when we sent them that letter, they made some sort of post that, you know, oh, we got this package and we'll stand up to our rights and, you know, um, you know nobody's going to sue us, something, something to that effect. And I was following all the comments from all of the patrons who were commenting on that, on that post and trying to see what the zoo was up to during this time period. 60 days lapsed. We didn't hear from them. So we turned around and we went and filed our lawsuit as expected. Uh, the complaint was served on uh, with, with a lot of effort. It was very difficult to try to get them to serve, uh, served on these individuals. They kept dodging service, weren't answering their phone. Um, it was a challenge, but those are sort of, you know, it's neither here nor there. Um, finally, once we did get this complaint served on them, the period of time expired for them to answer and we moved for default in the court. And finally, at that time, when the defendant came forward, we came to learn that they were starting to give away their animals. This is kind of the quintessential spoliation of evidence that you hear about um, or you might have heard about in law school. It's when you know, somebody is deleting files off of their computer, but here they're giving away the very subject matter with which we are trying to dispossess them of to a, a, a good home, to a good sanctuary that's qualified to handle that. So we immediately jumped into action. We prepared um, a temporary restraining order. Uh, we didn't end up filing it because we ended up getting a hearing with the judge on the phone. But we put the stop right away to his giving away the animals. Um, we wanted to close down the entire zoo, like not only just the individual endangered animals that we mentioned, but also everything else. This zoo did not belong uh, possessing any animals whatsoever, including goats, including chickens, anything. Um, there was just, they had no uh, right or no fortitude to really possess any animals. And so with the judge's assistance, uh, we were able to arrange through the Animal Defense Fund sanctuaries for all of the animals, for the wolf, for the tiger, um, for all of, all of the animals, found new places for them, uh, ended up shutting down the zoo completely, shuttered its doors. Uh, and so consider that a win at the end of the day. Um, it was a remarkable victory for these animals, getting them out of these very dilapidated conditions, even for owners that came into the possession of animals, maybe for you know, good reasons, you know, they, they, they wanted to uh, care for them, they wanted to, you know, give them give them a good home, but really bit off more than they could chew with something like this, you know, they did, it seemed like care about their animals, they weren't doing it, um, they weren't keeping these animals for, you know, uh, malicious purposes, just they, they couldn't do it anymore, it just wasn't the right thing, it wasn't the right place for these animals. And so, I think they realized that this was the exit opportunity from the zoo business that they really needed. And so at that time, when we finally involved the judge, when they started cooperating with us, we were able to get the result that was best for everybody. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was a great case. It brought me kind of full circle back to all of the issues from law school that I started with when I took um, you know, legal writing with an animal law professor who I ended up becoming a teaching assistant for later in law school. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity working for the Animal Defense Fund and a very talented pool of lawyers at the ALDF. Um, so it was a great experience. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, I was going to say, it sounds like these cases sort of brought you back to your first year writing assignment. Is that what drew you to them? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, again, thank you for all your help. Um, Truck, I know you also wanted to talk a little bit about your actually doing some pro bono work um, with a local humane society in Louisiana. Um, so not Animal Legal Defense Fund affiliated, but also great work. Um, so we wanted to, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about that as well. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Um, just in case anyone wanted to read the Tofurky decision that the Fifth Circuit issued, um, it's case number 22-3026. That's the Fifth Circuit case number. Um, so, oh, I, is my mic not? Yep. Oh, sure. Okay, we'll do. Thanks. Um, so, uh, I try and I try and um, help the Louisiana Humane Society anytime they have a legal issue. Um, and unfortunately, in Louisiana, one of the most recurring legal issues. Um, that you see, especially in rural Louisiana, and I think this probably happens a lot in the South, safe to say, hopefully not 
too much out here in the West Coast, but um, I, I would say it's an epidemic of police officers finding themselves on a citizen's property for one of many reasons. Maybe they're investigating a crime, maybe they're executing a arrest warrant or a search warrant. Um, maybe they are um, investigating a, a complaint of, of loud noises, like a domestic violence situation. That one seems pretty common. Uh, maybe they're doing a no-knock um, raid um, into, into someone's property, executing a no-knock warrant. And in these scenarios, inevitably, over and over in Louisiana, police officers shoot um, dogs that they encounter, citizens' dogs. Um, I, I get calls about these types of cases um, monthly, um, if not multiple times a month. And um, I, I wish that I could take all of them. There's just the volume of them, volume of them is, is, is intense. Uh, so I, I partnered with one other lawyer um, in a little, I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana. So I partnered with one other lawyer in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and she is interested in these cases as well. Um, so I've probably done about seven or eight of them now. So, so what the, the type of case this is, is it's um, a civil rights case brought under section 1983, and it's for unreasonable seizure of property um, in violation of the Fourth Amendment. And the seminal case that any plaintiff in this scenario relies on is the Hell's Angels decision, which is out of the Ninth Circuit. If anyone wants to read it, it's a fantastic decision. It's Ninth Circuit case number 02-16-329. And essentially what that case established was that uh, the destruction of a, a citizen's dog um, can constitute an unreasonable seizure of property under the Fourth Amendment. And there's a, there's a, a, a two-prong inquiry. So let me just back up and say, every police officer that's ever sued uh, in a case like this defends the case on the grounds of qualified immunity, which has a lot of controversy in America. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, qualified immunity won't won't be a thing for too much longer. Uh, that's at least my personal personal wish. Um, so it's a two 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 part inquiry. One is was the Constitution violated, and luckily for plaintiffs in a property seizure case is it's one of those law school loosey goosey was the officer's conduct unreasonable under the totality of the circumstances and that's a great that's a great test in my opinion because that's possible to get past summary judgment even in some of the more conservative uh districts in the united states including the fifth circuit because there's always going to be factors that that are on the the plaintiff side um Whereas if you contrast an excessive force against human humans case, which would also be a 1983 claim brought under uh, the Fourth Amendment, that has a much worse standard because instead of looking at the officer's conduct under the totality of the circumstances, uh, generally, at least in the Fifth Circuit, you're looking at a snapshot of the risk of harm allegedly presented to the officer at the moment force was used. Um, so if you think about that, that's that's really tough. I mean to take this to an absurd level, if someone was driving their car, a police officer could jump in front of their vehicle and then shoot the driver because at the moment force was used, the police officer was in danger of being run over. And um, in, in lots of excessive force cases, as well as cases where an officer shoots the dog, the argument is almost inevitably there may have been a risk of danger, but the officer unreasonably created it by, by doing what he did, by not taking precautions, by not being prepared, by not being trained, by not having non-lethal tools that his department may have given him um, available um, and on his, his person. So that's, that's the first step of the inquiry under the totality of the circumstances was the conduct unreasonable. Um, that one is always the, the, the best one, um, in my opinion. That's the easiest one to argue and um, I've been able to convince courts, uh, lots of courts that officers seizure of dogs was unreasonable under the totality of the circumstances. The Hells Angels case really kind of opened that up. Um, in the Hells Angels case, the uh, um, San Jose police, police department um, did a raid on a Hells Angel. That's like the motorcycle club. They raided a Hells Angels 
compound. And essentially they did like, I mean, months of, of recon and surveillance on this compound to, to develop a plan to, to go in and serve a bunch of arrest warrants, seize a bunch of property that they had warrants for. And in, in conducting their investigation and doing their, their uh, surveillance, they learned that there were several dogs on the property, uh, pet, pet dogs. Um, and they, they, despite having that knowledge, they came up with no plan to, to deal with interaction, interacting with these dogs that were non-lethal. Uh, essentially, they basically designated one guy on the, on the raid team, on the SWAT team, who had a, had a shotgun to be the person that is making sure the dogs don't interfere with the, the um, business that they had to conduct there. And inevitably, this officer concluded that all of the, I think, five dogs that were on the property were interfering with the investigation or presenting a danger to the officers and he shot all, all the dogs. Um, so, so this ended up going to the Ninth Circuit. And one, one kind of other kind of annoying thing about qualified immunity cases is if inevitably a police officer will move for summary judgment on qualified immunity grounds in, in these types of cases. And unfortunately, a denial of a summary judgment on qualified immunity grounds is, as you may or, not know, may, or may not know, immediately appealable to the appellate court. So if you think you're going to get to go to trial right after summary judgment and you, you win, it's not the case. You have to let the appellate court deal with it first before you get to get to a, a jury or, or, a, or a bench trial. Um, so the Ninth Circuit took it up. They won, the, the plaintiffs won in the district court and the Ninth Circuit took it up and affirmed the district court and held that failing to, to come up with any plan to use non-lethal means to, to interact with animals that they know are going to be on a, on a premises that they're going to serve warrants on uh, was, was unreasonable under the totality of the circumstances. So that's the first prong. That was bad. The second prong is under the case laws that exist right now in the United States, was it quote, quote unquote clearly established that the officer's conduct would violate a constitutional right? And that is the hard one to get past. It's really hard because different courts have different opinions of what does clearly establish me. The Ninth Circuit has a really good standard for, for plaintiffs. It basically says, you don't need to have a case right on point that says SWAT teams can't shoot dogs when, when raiding a, a compound. Um, you just have to have analogous case law that would put a reasonable officer on notice that his conduct would violate the Constitution. And it's kind of silly if you think about it. I, I don't know a lot of police officers that are reading Ninth Circuit and Fifth Circuit decisions, but that's that's the that's the test for qualified immunity. So, in, in this Ninth Circuit Hells Angels case, uh, the court said that although there's not a case directly on point, there's other cases that generally would put a reasonable officer on notice that you can't do that. So the Ninth Circuit case was a win for the plaintiffs. Ended up, uh, City of San Jose ended up play, paying the Hells Angels like a little bit over a million dollars, um, which was a really nice precedent. So my my goal is I, I do a lot of these cases in Louisiana. Um, um, probably going to start some in Texas, maybe Florida. My goal is to, when I retire from the practice of law, make the Fifth Circuit president in this topic a little bit more like the Ninth, ninth Circuit president. Um, in Louisiana, and in the Fifth Circuit, it's very hard to win the clearly established prong. They, Fifth Circuit has a little bit more narrow definition of what is clearly established, and they want a case that is, while it doesn't have to be directly on point, they, they want a case that deals with an officer shooting somebody's dog and that court holding the officer's conduct unconstitutional. And then that conduct deemed unconstitutional has to be somewhat similar to the case you're litigating. Obviously that is a challenge. Um, there's only two right now, um, Fifth Circuit decisions that deal with dog shootings. And one of them is really good for plaintiffs and one of them is really bad for plaintiffs. There's about to be another one coming out in the next 60 days. And then I have a case going to, um, the Fifth Circuit, um, it'll it'll be argued probably January, February. So we may have a ruling on that one in in late 2024. Uh, so hopefully we will get some precedent in the Fifth Circuit that is similar to the Ninth Circuit. But um, I encourage all of you, if 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 you ever um, know of any any family who this has happened to, um, to to encourage them to consult with an attorney because a lot of a lot of folks, especially in rural areas, do not even know 
that they have constitutional constitutional rights that may have been violated when the police when a police officer kills their dog. Oh, so yeah, that's another thing I'm really passionate about. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, I I know that we actually get a fair amount of these requests in too through our public assistance request channels. So um, unfortunately, I don't think I think it is something that is prevalent across the country. Um, so, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll just add to anybody who knows of anybody who does deal with these issues um, or has encountered this issue. Um, you know, we do have our public assistance request form online. So. Um, I recommend maybe contacting Duroc if you're in the Louisiana area, um, but in other states, you know, we can we can help find an attorney for those matters. If anyone if anyone here, I assume there are some lawyers in the audience. If anyone here ever finds themselves with with this kind of a case, hit me up, email me, text me, and I'll, I'll share ideas. I'll share case law. Um, I'll help you in any way any way that I can. Thank you for that. Um, so I did, I know we talked a little bit about sort of what drew you to the cases that you're working on um, as far as animal law, but um, if you want to talk a little bit about more about that and specifically how, you know, with your firms or, you know, your your cases that you've been involved with, how you sort of got that process going with them um, to be able to be involved. Sure. So I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, <clears throat> as an associate at a law firm, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to bring in a pro bono case than perhaps if you're a partner or somebody who has, you know, kind of the, the ear of the partnership in that in that same way. So I'll talk maybe a little bit about my experience as an associate bringing in some of that work and Tarak can talk about his experience as well. Um, the unfortunate truth about most all law firms, uh, probably all law firms, is they're profit generating vehicles. They are in the business primarily to uh, you know, they have to sustain the business, they have to pay employees, they have to keep the lights on. So, you know, they're primarily always driven by, you know, work that can generate income for the firm. And so pro bono work, uh, which obviously is being, you know, services that are rendered uh, for free, uh, the attorney's fees services are being rendered for free, is not always something that law firms are thinking about, or in some ways, you know, tuned into. And so there are opportunities, I think, as an attorney, especially as an associate, to bring those kinds of cases into the firm or at least get the partnership interested in wanting to get involved in giving back in that, in that capacity. And I think doing animal rights litigation is an excellent opportunity um, in, in many ways, uh, not the least of which is doing some really excellent work and, and making a real uh, difference for these animals' lives. Um, from a conflicts standpoint, it is uh, much easier to clear conflicts at your firm because you are doing work that very often you won't have, you know, being your firm may, depending on the size of the firm, is probably not doing work on the other side of the V for these entities um, in any way that you're likely to be encountering in a lawsuit or suing. And so from a conflict standpoint, it's easier to clear that hurdle, I think. As an associate, uh, generally speaking, you're going to need partnership approval or a mentor, a partner mentor, for example, to sort of shadow you on the case, even though you will be the primary one and I was the primary one handling these litigations with very, very minimal um, you know, support uh, on a day-to-day -day basis from the partner. The partner was there to make sure that everything was proceeding as, as, as we had envisioned. But uh, you need sort of somebody to be your, your chaperone or your sponsor at the firm to kind of see you through on that, or at least to sign off on the line that the firm is committed to dedicating its time pro bono to help on that matter. Um, from uh, the standpoint of selling it to your firm, uh, you know, it's really excellent work uh, to work for an organization, especially as, as strong as the ALDF. Uh, this isn't an organization, and this is not a knock to any other organizations out there, um, where they're looking for legal help, but they don't have the backbone of support or the foundation uh, to help you through sort of the stickier issues or in the, in the case of rehoming an animal, finding a sanctuary. The Animal Legal Defense Fund is extremely well-versed and the attorneys are smart, sharp, very well-credentialed and just excellent people to work with. And you know that is, you know as far as selling a pro bono opportunity to your firm is concerned, the ALDF is a fantastic organization, not just for their purpose, but also for their personnel. So that kind of makes our job as an attorney bringing in a pro bono case easier in that way. Um, and then, you know, purely from a, a marketing standpoint from the firm, it just looks great to the public to see, you know, the firm loves to be able to publish the opportunities that they've gotten involved with to give back to not only their local community, but to 
you know, the nation generally and getting involved with the Animal Defense Fund is a really excellent way to do that. Um, my experience with those two cases after we closed down those zoos, my firm, uh, through my insistence, came out with and we did holiday gifts every year for our clients. We generated these plush dolls of some of the animals that we had rescued, along with a little cue card that gave a small story about what the firm did. And a number of the partners sent these gifts out to their clients to sort of show, you know, well, here's a tiger. They can give it to their kids. It's got, you know, a bandana around its neck with the firm's name on it. But it comes with a great picture of the animal and a story about what the firm did to rescue this animal and sort of the, the feel good kind of work that the firm does uh, with its pro bono time. And so there are marketing opportunities as well. And clients are, are really interested to see, especially when it comes to selecting a law firm for business. Not only do they want a diverse panel of attorneys on the case and attorneys who are experienced, but you know, it's about the human connection as well. It's about finding a group of people to work on your matters that you are aligned with their values. And um, it's, uh, it's a really great thing to be able to talk about uh, that you've done this sort of pro bono work. Not only as an associate, do you get legal experience and exposure handling these matters firsthand? And that's a, a whole nother benefit of doing the pro bono work as well is getting that sort of experience earlier in your career to appear before judges and do those kinds of things. So not only can you sell the substantive experience to future clients, but you can also talk about the great work that the firm does and kind of share your values with hopefully the client's values as well. And a lot of people have pets. A lot of people out there care about animals deeply, some more than others. But, you know, it's, it's a really heartwarming, good for the soul kind of work. Um, and it's only been, you know, a, a benefit to me in my practice and to the firms uh, that I've worked in. I've changed firms a couple of times, but each of them has been really excited to sort of get involved in, in this sort of work. And I think that, um, you know, experience is a um, emblematic of the kind of work the Animal Defense Fund does. And they're a great organization to work with, as I mentioned. So, so I wish your firm's um, approach and attitude towards pro bono um, would, would percolate more throughout the United States and trickle down to, to the, the, the South. Um, I think that um, law firms, follow the trend of big big law, generally speaking. I think AmLaw 100 starts starts doing something and within five to 10 years, you'll see other other regional law firms do it. I mean, I think the classic example is, um, I think Kirkland Ellis probably started the dichotomy of, of equity partner versus income partner. I think before that, all firms, you either had a partner or you were an associate and didn't make partner, then you didn't make it. Um, now firms, including my firm, Louisiana, and lots of firms have this dichotomy. You can make one level of partnership first and then the second level. Um, so so what, what I'm hoping is um, big law firms that, that support pro bono efforts, not, not, not just allow it, but encourage it and support it. I think, I think Covington and Burling actually has some, some pro bono requirement and may give actual billable hour credit to their associates that are doing pro bono work. To me, that's supporting pro bono, not just allowing it. Um, in, in the South, specifically in, in Louisiana, um, there, there, there are no requirements um, for anyone to do any pro bono. You just don't really see it a lot, except for the people that do it, and those people do it a lot. Um, I have some friends that are at firms, uh, some are associates, some are partners, where their firms do not allow it because that is hurting the bottom line, essentially. You have an attorney that could be billing hours that's spending time doing something else. And I think that's very unfortunate um, with, with firms that don't allow it. Um, putting those firms aside, there's firms that do allow it. But what does that mean? What, what, what happens when you get a bill for six depositions? Who's gonna who cover that? Obviously. In most of these pro bono cases, um, some not all, your clients are indigent, so it's not going to be it's not going to be the client that's paying for it. So who 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 pays for the experts? You know, sometimes it it all it all depends. Sometimes the pro bono attorney pays for it out of his out of her own pocket. Um, but I think it would be a great idea for all firms to, at a minimum, give associates some sort of credit towards any billable hour requirements they, they may have. I think that's at a minimum. Um, 
my firm doesn't do any of that. When I was an associate, they would allow me to do pro bono. Um, now as a partner, they allow me to do it and they support it as well, uh, meaning that they will pay reasonable deposition costs, reasonable expert costs, reasonable travel, so on and so forth. But I still have to approach these kinds of cases much differently than when I'm representing AT&T for some you know, breach of contract with some municipality. Um, so, so cost is still an issue, but I'm allowed to do it. We don't give any sort of credit to any associates, but I think that as that becomes more established in, in AMLAW 100 firms, I think that'll trickle down. And I, I hope that regional firms like my firms uh, get that. And then just to echo some of the things that Brian said, um, the associates that work on me with my um, animal law pro bono cases, they get they get first chair trial attorney experience. Um, whether that's, it, it, I'll use that term even if the case doesn't go to trial. They get to, they get to be the person that does the depositions. Uh, they get to argue motions for summary judgment. Um, when, when a case does go to trial, associates inevitably in these types of cases will get to take witnesses, maybe do an opening, maybe do a closing. And you just don't get that kind of experience as an associate on huge complex commercial litigation cases. Um, at least not in, not in my firm and, and not in a lot of firms that I can think of, but you can here. Um, so great experience. Um, another, another thing that firms, I think, don't realize when they're evaluating what, what their attitude towards pro bono should be is it really gives your firm a good reputation among the federal judiciary and maybe even the state judiciary. I know so many Louisiana judges in places where I've never necessarily had a commercial litigation case. I know them well. They've, they've understood that I've brought pro bono cases in their courts. They've had settlement conferences where the master judge might even assist um, me in, in settling the matter for my client. And then the next time I see them is when I have a commercial case in front of them. And I feel like I already am a known, known, known commodity. I'm going to get the benefit of the doubt. And uh, it, it's great. It's, it's great to have that reputation with, with judges. Um, Finally, I think it's good publicity for your firm. When we won the Tofurky case, at least at the district court level, I mean, it was all over the news. And I mean, really it was, it was Amanda Howell at the ALDF won this case, but, but her support staff, uh, Jones Walker, got a lot of really fantastic press as well. And, uh, you know, it hasn't happened yet, but if we keep doing these types of cases, we're doing another one right now in Texas, we may get some, some, some paid work for First Amendment stuff. Like we may, start getting those kinds of calls as well. So there's so many good reasons to support your attorneys, um, if not maybe strongly encourage them to work on pro bono math. Great, well, thank you both. Um, yeah, and for anybody at a firm um, who is interested in possibly working with ALDF on pro bono matters, um, please feel free to contact our pro bono program um, and we can sort of help you through that process as well. Um, I know you both sort of touched on it a little bit, but, um, you know, the benefits of pro bono. So both individually and, you know, through your firms. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to expand on that, but also maybe discuss if there are any challenges you've encountered with doing pro bono work. Um, Brian, would you like to start? Sure. So <clears throat> my uh, inclination to want to do pro bono, pro bono work sort of starts in this value of making the world a better place. Uh, as a lawyer at a private practice firm, especially a larger firm where the primary focus is always about generating profit, um, especially in the civil case, you find yourself arguing over dollars and cents all the time. You know, who can you win money for and what what is that, you know, the value of the claim worth? Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're just making one entity richer than the other or you're stopping another one from doing something that's, you know, infringing a patent or violating an intellectual property right in my practice. And so, you know, from a standpoint of wanting to make the world a better place or, you know, at least advance the bar in some capacity, pro bono gives you the opportunity to at least start making a difference in, in that way. And hopefully, you know, in some of the work, for example, like Tarak is doing, will make a, a larger impact in a uh, judicial district like the Fifth Circuit, for example. So doing pro bono work, um, not only does it feel really good and it kind of gives you that opportunity to kind of get that substantive experience, 
but it's also uh, really great for hopefully starting to turn the law uh, more favorably towards animals' rights in the various judicial districts. Um, something that I've come to learn in practicing in kind of litigating against, against these uh, zoos, uh, roadside zoos, is that depending on what state or district you find yourself in, you may find more favorable or less favorable law uh, for your case. And certainly, for example, when I started the Ricky the Bear case, there was no animal rights law existing in Pennsylvania for us to use or to form the crux of our, of our action. And so we had to blaze a new path. We had to make new law, sort of in the way that you learn about in law school, right? Taking public nuisance. How far can we stretch the boundaries of public nuisance to help protect an animal that's in inhumane captivity? And the answer in that case was, we can do it. Um, you can push those boundaries as an attorney. You can expand the law in your practice favorably um, for animals. And thankfully in Pennsylvania, they have now passed an animal rights statute. I don't think it goes quite as far as it should, but it's remarkably uh, in the right direction, especially from where we started from litigating public nuisance kinds of cases. And other states and other federal districts could also benefit from expansions of their law if legislation isn't always possible and legislatures um, don't always enact the right kinds of laws or things will stall and just really never come to fruition, it becomes part of the judiciary's intent to get to the right place using the existing laws and the existing lines of cases as you find them. And so doing this kind of work has been really instrumental for me in pushing the boundary and making the law a little bit better and opening the judiciary's eyes to the, these problems that you know, are happening across the country with these, with these zoos keeping animals in, in terrible conditions. And it just, it, it feels good to me and I think to the attorneys I've worked with um, that we are advancing the bar. We are making a difference for animals, even if in small steps with each one of these cases, it's a general progression in the right and correct direction. Very well put. Um, one thing I love is I love the feeling of giving the indigent underdog the full force of a large corporate law firm, the same quality and level of representation that that Exxon may may get, giving it to a family that lives in a trailer in the middle middle of nowhere that police officers did something terrible to. Um, just for example, that that really makes me feel good. Um, you you mentioned challenges. Uh, here's one that I'm always facing. Um, in in the, in most of the pro bono work that I do it usually involves having a government entity on the other side of the V. Um, so, you know, lots of big law firms tip, typically don't represent state and local governments. So we're probably clear on a conf conflicts from a conflict standpoint, um, but but there's lots of political hurdles, especially if your firm um, has has like a government government law like or, or lobbying arm to it. There's a lot of hesitancy to file a suit where you have to name a government official, even if it's just procedural, procedural as the actual defendant. For example, on, on the Tofurky case, I had to, I had to uh, name Michael Strain, he's Louisiana's commissioner of agriculture as the main defendant. The case was titled Tofurky v. Strain. And uh, we ran conflicts, we never represented Michael Strain, we never represented the Department of Agriculture. All good, we opened the file, I started rolling. I then get a phone call, probably, gosh, two months into the representation from a very, very important, uh, some may say scary partner of the firm, and basically was like, did you sue Mike Strain? <laughs> I, I, I did, it cleared conflicts, is there, you know, is there a problem? And he was like, well, you know, we, we, we represent a lot of clients and we, lobby in front of Mike Strain and all kinds of other government officials. So you need to be really careful. In that instance, you know, the case was already rolling. There was not there was no nothing to do. Um and and ultimately it it, it never posed an issue. I've never heard of our clients have any have having any issues um in their in our firm's lobbying efforts for state officials. But it's another thing to think about political hurdles. Yeah, great. Those are both good, really good points. Um, I know that we are getting close to the end of the session, um, so I definitely wanted to leave time for any audience questions. Um, so I, but I also wanted to make sure we played the Ricky the Bear video, if we could do that now.
Ricky's doing really good. I mean, all bears and all rescued animals have to go through rehabilitation and that's uh, kind of a, a different beast for each one in the sense that, you know, some can um, be re rehabilitated and released into with other animals pretty quickly. Um, Ricky kind of came at a weird time because it was winter. And so many, as many people know, she came, was awake, but then kind of went into a half hibernation and had to wait until spring to meet all the other bears in the habitat. And so in general, given her scenario, she's doing really well, meaning that she comes out, she's interacted with a number of the bears. She actually has, you know, a female that she likes more than others. And then she's got some boys that come around as well. And so she's still being reserved in a sense because, you know, she's still the newest one in that habitat. But otherwise, I think progress compared to all bears that we bring in that come from situations like Ricky's, that she's at, you know, at a normal or ahead of schedule in a sense of what she's doing, you know, and she's explored at least 50% of the habitat by now. She's, you know, got her own den that she still feels safe going to. She has an introduction pen that's relatively the same size as what she lived in before. However, the door is open. She can come and go as she pleases. So it kind of gives her a little bit of comfort. Um, so the 15 acres, she's, like I said, gone about on seven acres of that. And, and since she's been out, she tends to stay somewhat near her pen. And then in the night is when most bears tend to really go out and look around. So at this point, probably the best thing we're going to do is get one of the trail cams out and start seeing what she's doing at night. So she definitely has one of those gates that's typical of being on a concrete surface and being confined. And she's not in pain. She and, and things like that do improve to some degree. So as she starts to really get out there and put some miles on and do some of those things, we will see muscles improve and that'll help her, her stance improve. So in general, she doesn't seem to be in pain. She seems pretty happy. She comes over, she's come up the fence numerous times. Um, she knows her keepers and all that. And so, you know, I would say in general, this is a huge improvement for her and that she still has a lot more to, to, to do and to enjoy. And, you know, so she'll spend upwards of a year getting the whole experience before she's kind of finished with the, the, the new environment she has. Thank you so much. So we'll, and we'll now turn to questions from the audience. Um, if you do have a question, please line up behind one of the microphones at the front of the room. Um, and if you're joining us virtually, please do submit your questions via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. I have a comment and a question. Um, sitting here, I was really, I was smiling most of the time because you're bringing up things that we've we've dealt with in the past. One, Brian, is that um, after the Chuck Robardi decision came down a long time ago, um, the patent office announced that they would now uh, accept applications for the patenting of multicellular animals. And um, we were horrified uh, about that. And so there's a case you may or may not be aware of, Alder versus Quig which we lost, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but in which we were arguing animal rights stuff and in which we were saying, how can you possibly compare a single celled amoeba to a multicellular, I mean, in this case, it was uh, Harvard had uh, developed the onco mouse, a mouse who was uh, pre pre not preordained, but much more likely to, to get cancer. And so then they could use them to study cancer. And we were saying, you cannot possibly compare an amoeba to a fully functioning mouse. The federal circuit, we may as well have been speaking Martian to them. It, it would have been really nice to have had you with us at that time, but this was, you were probably still in high school. So <laughs> but if you ever get a look at that case, we lost the case in the US, but the same case was brought in Canada and they won the case, Harvard lost, and you can't patent animals in Canada. So, uh, but there've been a lot of animals patented in the US. Tarak, a, a question for you. We've for years dealt with the what we call the cop shooting the dog cases. Um, and one of the things that might be of value in addition to the lawsuits and winning them would be, and I wonder if you've talked about this maybe with the uh, ALDF's criminal justice program, going into police departments or going into their conferences at a state level and asking them to change their policies because their policy 
for most cops is shoot the dog, get the dog out of the way, and then then do what you need to do. Now, if that's the policy, that's what they're going to do until someone comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, in other states, they're not doing that. They've developed programs. And I wonder if that's something you've been discussing at all, maybe going to DA's conferences or, or, or law enforcement conferences and just telling them, hey, I'm, I'm suing you guys. If you don't want to be sued, maybe we could talk about policy changes. Excellent question. Thanks for, thanks for asking that. Um, so yeah, it's something that we certainly think about in every single case. It's not about making money. Um, it's about affecting change. Um, so so uh, we had two cases against the same sheriff's office in a rural parish in Louisiana and uh, same defense attorney for both cases and the same two plaintiff's attorneys uh, for the cases, myself and a friend of mine that I partner with on these types of cases. And uh, they both settled um, and the settlement entailed um, training, additional training. Um, we tried to allow the settlement to, to, we tried to get the settlement to require them to actually affect additional policy, let us help them draft some policies and procedures, but, but that ended up not becoming part of this part of the settlement. But uh, we were allowed to provide training to the police officers in effective ways to encounter companion animals um, using non-lethal methods. And uh, I, I use an expert by the name of Jim Crosby. He is um, America's, if not the world's, like foremost authority on non-lethal methods available to police in, in encountering canines. Um, so in one instance, we, we um, tried it two different ways. In one instance, we had Jim Crosby provide the training and he's a, a retired Jacksonville Sheriff's Deputy with over 20 years experience. He then ran the county animal control there and he now has a PhD in veterinary science. So he's like the, the, the cop dog guy, essentially. So we had him do a, do a training, uh, training officers on how to use um, tasers effectively against animals, um, pepper spray, batons. Um, usually when a cop shoots a dog, they could have just used their, their boot to mitigate whatever threat they they perceived um so we did that and we had we had some success well actually let me say this we haven't had to sue that sheriff's department again since crosby did their training um we've also tried it where the plaintiff's attorneys uh go in and give a presentation to the police officers themselves and we've gotten a little bit less success with that because i think that before they go to this i think their their supervisors say we're required to send you guys to this this guy who sued us is going to now tell you how to do your job. Um, so, so I think I think that going forward, we we probably not go that route where the plaintiffs' attorneys give this presentation because the thing is, is like a, a police officer, and maybe justifiably so, is going to question my right or ability to advise them on police practices when I don't have any law enforcement experience. I've never, you know, faced the dangers a law enforcement officer has had to. So, I think training with somebody with um, some 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 better background is the, is the way to go in, in a settlement agreement. I had a question about the labeling laws in Arkansas and Louisiana. You mentioned um, how there's not really much evidence presented for passing those laws and zero. Yeah. And as someone who is, I mean, it's pretty obvious uh, plant-based meat and meat are very different. Was there any Anything presented? Any arguments that had any merit on the other side? Send me an email. I'm going to reply to you with the one page of discussion transcript about passing the 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 uh, Truth and Labeling Act in Louisiana. I'm telling you nothing. It's just, you know, it's a guy who has some constituents that are think that their their you know bottom line is being affected by tofurkey or beyond meat or something, which I, I, I would question whether that's true as well. And they get their buddy who's on the state legislature to try and pass an act that says you can't do business in our state if you're you know, selling vegan vegan food products and so on and so forth. So absolutely nothing. The, the, the real challenge seems to be, and we're gonna find out what happens in Texas, it seems to be the, the, the state saying, you don't really have standing because your, your product doesn't violate any of these laws. Uh, so that seems to kind of be the 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 main defense because it's hard to defend on the merits because what you just 
question is completely lacking. There's no evidence of consumer confusion. Um, well, I think we are almost at time. So maybe we just have a few moments just to say a last uh, parting words of advice for anybody who's interested in pro bono. Um, if you know what, if you have any advice for people who are interested in, in looking into it. Um, to put it in the, if there are any Star Wars fans out there, do it. <laughs> right? Like this is, um, it, it's to me, it's a no brainer to the extent your firm will allow you to just do it. Um, it's just, it's great work, uh, it's great experience, and it's for an excellent cause. Um, as attorneys, I think it's drilled into our heads in law school, at least to some extent, that it's our job to sort of, you know, change the law, to make the law better uh, through our practice, and to, especially in the case of individuals who can't afford an attorney, to provide this level of services to help those in need uh, to the maximum extent possible. And you know, animals, they don't have deep pockets, right? Like they don't have anybody advocating for them um, when they often should. And there needs to be a larger army of people like us to do this kind of work. And it's, it's amazing. It's a great opportunity to work with the ALDF and to do pro bono work more generally. So my advice to everybody is to the maximum extent that you can uh, make time in your practice, carve out some time for pro bono work and you won't regret it. Um. Couple, couple parting statements. Um, it's, 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 it's difficult to be a very hardworking attorney at a law firm and have a lot of billable hours and be really profitable and also really give your, your full attention to multiple pro bono cases at a time. So my suggestion, what I've done is, is meet, meet people, meet, meet other lawyers, come to conferences like this, meet people in, in your jurisdiction, meet people in other jurisdictions and develop a network and have a team that brings the pro bono case where, where somebody can step in and step up if somebody is just out of commission for a trial with their you know, regular, regular paid work. Um, that's, that's one very, very important uh, lesson I've learned. That's a great idea to have a team of lawyers. Second, um, show your firm that you can be a very productive and profitable member of your firm and also do pro bono. I think there's a stereotype that at, at some firms, I think there was at my firm, not, not so much anymore, that people that do pro bono are typically not partnership track people, people that are not profitable. These are folks that may uh, end up getting some kind of position as counsel or something, ultimately not, not partner. Um, prove, prove them wrong at your firm. And um, finally, I guess this ties into it. Someday, um, I assume there's a lot of lawyers here, you'll be running your firm. Um, change, change the requirements. Give associates pro bono uh, credit. Uh, make a requirement that um, attorneys in your firm do, do something. Maybe not an hourly requirement pro bono, but some, some kind of pro bono experience should be a requirement. I think states should have law firms. There should be a requirement that law firms handle X amount of pro bono by, by states. Um, so once you're in the decision-making um, choose if you're not already change, change things up and support pro bono. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tarak. Thank you, Brian. Um, this was a great discussion. A recording of this session will be available on the virtual event platform next week. Um, this does conclude the 30, 31st annual animal law conference.